All right, let's pray. Dear Father, I just want to thank you for your grace. just want to thank you for giving something that we don't deserve, which is your grace. just want to thank you for giving it to us freely. just want to thank you for the mercy. But we have something that's even better than that, that we're included in something that, uh, that was hit, kept secret since the world began. And I just want to just thank you for that. Thank you for the message. Thank you for your words that, that uh, you give to us so we can know who we are. just want to thank you for being reliable. We can count on it. And just want to just thank you for all these things. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> All right, so we're in Ephesians chapter 1 here still, kind of moving on into chapter 2, but uh, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's just back up to the beginning of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, not by his will, but by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how he's, every epistle that Paul writes, and writes to the church, the body of Christ, <clears throat> notice how he says grace and peace from our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's because when, we get, when you get into the book of Revelation, you start reading about the prophesied judgment that was talked about in Isaiah and Ezekiel and all these different prophetic books, is that... It's not grace and peace. And, there's, and there's, the two members are going to be a part of that judgment. But he's telling, the, you know, he's telling us, he's telling all these people here today, not only those in Ephesus, but grace and peace be unto you. From whom? From God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So verse 3, who's the one that's actually doing the blessing? It's God the Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So we've been blessed by something about in Christ. And it's the Father that's doing it. According as he hath chosen us in him. Who's the him? Chosen us in Christ. Before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So now, think about this. Genesis 1.1. Right? Keep your hand here. Let's just turn to it. Genesis 1.1. Even I should be able to find that relatively quick, quickly. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, in the beginning, God created what? The heaven and the earth. Okay, back to Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him... Before the foundation of the world. Who? Who are the people that were chosen? It would be to the saints that are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So before the foundation of the world, God had something that he was planning on doing. And he was going to bless those whom were in Christ Jesus. Before the foundation of the world. There. That he had a goal. He had something he was going to accomplish. Before the foundation of the world. That we. These people that are who? In Christ. That are blessed with all these spiritual blessings. We should be holy and without blame. Before God. Before him in love. So every individual that this is written to, which are those who are the faithful, that means that those that trust are holy and without blame before him in love. And he determined that before he actually built everything. Having predestinated us, unto what? Unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So there's adoption. Being, being called an adult, being 
brought in and taken as you are my inheritor. That's what adoption, biblical adoption is. That was what adoption was at that time when this is being written, is that this is my inheritor. And this inheritor is at a mature enough age to execute in my stead, to do things. Their name's on the checkbook. They want to make this purchase. They have the right to do that. Okay? And before the foundation of the world, God determined that, you know what? Those who trust in my son will get that. We don't have to make this complicated. This is not meant to be complicated. This is, but this is information that was not known. Okay? But there's a purpose for that. There's a purpose for you and me being put into this adoption where we're at a, at a, as a mature individual that has rights and privileges of the adult, of the, of the, of the adult that gave them to you, that there's a reason for that. And, and, and we're going to get to that. Verse 10. That in the dispensations of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in her earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. The predestination is, is that these people in Christ would be in the dispensation of the fullest of times he would gather together in one. Everything all under the headship of the Son. And you and me are part of that. Now, we are holy and without blame before him in love, the end of verse 4, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. By, by what? By Jesus Christ to himself. So it's going to be what Jesus Christ did, he is going to adopt you and me and every other believer unto himself, the adoption. Now what is the adoption? Okay. What is the adoption? Keep Ephesians chapter 1. Let's go back up to Romans chapter 8. It defines it. If we don't know what adoption means, I suggest the best thing that you could do is find out where he's talking about adoption and tells you about it. The biblical adoption that Paul's talking about matches up with something that's already been set up before. So now, verse 22. Romans 8, 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now. It's not just you. Okay? I'm groaning today. Maybe you are. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have what? The first fruits of the Spirit. What is the first fruits? That's Jesus Christ. The first fruits of the Spirit is Jesus Christ. Christ the first fruits. Okay? Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, to know, to understand the what? The redemption of our body. Okay? This body being redeemed, for we are saved by hope. Okay. So what the adoption that Paul is talking about back in Ephesians chapter 1, in this predestinating us into, is what? A, 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 a mature individual that has a redeemed body was determined before the foundation of the world. The redemption of our body was determined before the foundation of the world. The concept of it there was there before there was a heaven, before there was an earth. And what was his plan to do? His plan was to put all in Christ, and he's, and he's telling them that, guess what? 
You are an inheritor. You are a joint heir with Christ. Okay? And it's putting everything all under the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, when we talk, we don't hear the term maybe a lot today, but most, I think everybody in here would understand if I said, well, the cabinet body, you know, you know, you know so you know, Abraham Lincoln had a cabinet, okay? They were the members of, you know, and the cabinet body felt that this was, or the cabinet body had this responsibility. All right, so now what are you? What we're going to find out, we're going to work into, is that you are a part of Christ's body. So you were a part of, what does that cabinet body do? It's a part of a leadership. Okay? It's a part of executing duties. And he says, you and I are a part of that. That's, that's authority in government. Okay? Before the foundation of the world, God said, I'm going to take those who trust in my son and I'm going to put them as part of the body that's in charge. There's a plan. Okay? What do we have? Do we have a corrupt earth? Is it under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ right now? No. If it is, you better rethink things and look at it and say, really? All right. No. What about heaven? Is it entirely under the head and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ? No. We take all things in heaven and earth, place them in one body under the complete authority of it. Now, verse 6. Well, verse 5. Having predestinated us in, unto the adoption. Every one of us has a destiny, and the adoption is that destiny that is the redemption of our body. According to the good pleasure of His will. Not my will. It was His will. Before I existed. It was His will that He would take everyone who trusted in Christ. To the praise of the glory of His grace. What does that mean? It'd be to His glory by taking someone as ugly as me, I'm talking about ugly on the inside, not only on the outside, and putting him, putting a person like me, and it would be to His glory. Now let's just think about it. All creation will look at me and look at you. And He'll say, and creation will say, He did that. With that, he put them up there. My, 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 what a God. You can do that. Wow. Okay. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted. We weren't accepted before. Now we're accepted in who? In the beloved. What does that mean? Accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. Come with me to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, I go to a lot because that's where we actually first get it. You know, as, as we start reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, we actually get introduced to John the Baptist there. Okay? That's a first, as you're reading, as you leave the Old Testament section or the, and move into the Old Testament new scriptures, okay? And, we, and we, we, get, we meet up with John the Baptist. Now, he's the one that was spoken of, okay? Now, John, verse 11, Matthew 3, 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. Too big a shoes for me to put on. You think I'm great? I ain't nothing. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will truly purge his floor. What's he going to do? He's going to get rid of the junk. He's going to purge it. He's going to get rid of what don't belong. 
and gather his wheat to the garner. That's the container. That's the storage container that's going to keep it safe for the use. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It's the byproduct that is a result of that, that's along with the seed, but he's going to get rid of that. And he's going to just have what's the useful part of it. He's going to burn up the rest. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, said, I have need to be baptized of thee. What does he need to be baptized with? He, he needs to go through the baptism that Jesus is going to baptize him with. I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered, said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. You, you, need, you need to do it. Why? For what reason? For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness, and he suffered him. What did he, without that, there was no fulfilling of all righteousness. Okay. Now what was that all about? Jesus needed to be inaugurated in the beginning into his priestly duties. From that time on, he begins going into working in the office of a priest. Before that time, he hadn't. So it was necessary. Why? What does every priest go through? First off, they get washed with water. Okay? Then after that, they get anointed with the holy oil. So what is that? What is Jesus doing? He's going to get washed with water. Here, here's this cleansing ceremony that you go through. Then comes the anointing oil. But notice, what is, what is oil used for with, the, with these guys? Oil is used for the light, right? It's the source of the light for the fuel for the lamps. So now, so the next thing would be is to anoint the head, Okay? The natural thing for a priest. But now, the one who's going to do this is going to be the spirit that does this. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened up, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And lighting upon him. And lo, so now, so now we see the Spirit descending and coming down on him. Well, that oil that was on their head, that was to be the representation of the light that that priest carried. Okay? But the real anointing that Jesus Christ gets is he actually gets it, the, the Spirit of God descending on him. Now he is inaugurated with power. And then what happens? Verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my what? Beloved. Beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Beloved Son. Okay. Now, beloved. Keep that. Come to chapter 17. Chapter 17. Not the only time they hear this. Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. And, six, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up unto a, a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before him, and his face did what? Shine as the sun. And his raiment was what? White as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, that's Elijah, talking with him, with Jesus Christ, on the mount. They're seeing Jesus Christ. They call it the Mount of Transfiguration because he was transfigured. What was he transfigured into? It was unveiled, the light that he actually is. Okay? Now, in John 1, the beginning, you know, in John chapter 1, it talks about he was the light of man, the true light, the light of every man. What they're seeing is the physical manifestation of the light that he is. 
they see him unveiling. Okay? Then, sorry, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. What does he say? A tabernacle. Let me think. Let's, let's put up a house for you, and for you, and for you. Why? You're going to dwell here. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So the voice out of the cloud, the bright cloud around him says, no, you listen up. You, you, you listen to what he's going to tell you to do. Okay, these are your ideas. What is he going to tell you to do? But my point here is that he said, this is my what? Beloved son. Beloved. Come back to Ephesians chapter 1. The beloved. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the what? In the beloved. Who have we been accepted in? Jesus Christ. That's what makes us acceptable. Acceptable. In whom? Jesus Christ. We have what? Redemption. You're bought. You're redeemed. We have redemption through what? Through his blood. That's the, that's the actual thing of value. The blood is the payment. The forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace. We've been bought through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Grace. The value that's in that giving that. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. The mystery. So there's something that's known. Well, what was known? What? Verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the, of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God had an understanding that there would be a corruption that would happen inevitably about creating creatures that have free will. So in anticipation of that, what did he do? He said, you know what? I'm going to give you free will. And I know the results of the free will is going to be that. But I am going to do what with them? I am going to make them accepted in my son to those who will trust him. I'll forgive their sins. I'll make them right. I'll call them holy. I'll call them righteous. I'll pay for their sin in order to do that. And they'll be accepted in my son to me. Simple as that. In anticipation of the inevitable thing that would happen. And why is that? That in the dispensation, verse 10, of the fullness of times. What is a dispensation? To, to dispense, a dispensary is something that's given out, right? A dispensary. You have, you, in, a, in a hospital, you have the drug dispensary. We have, you know, that is where th something is dispensed. But now we have a dispensation. That which is dispensed at a certain period. Okay? Now, the interesting thing is, is that most Bibles actually will, will call this an administration. Okay? William Tyndale, who the majority of your translation came from, actually called it an, an, an administration. It's administration that's dispensed. So now, our Bible, King James Bible, says, is saying, this administration which is dispensed 
If you just have administration, you miss the dispensing of it. But this administration, which was put out, which is what he's saying by saying the word dispensation, by an administration that's put out, that means it wasn't always here. It's happening. Okay? That in the dispensation, and in, now wasn't he talking about an inheritance? What's being dispensed is an administration which you are a part of. That's being dispensed in the future. How do I know that? The dispensation of the fullness of times. It's somewhere out there on the, on the timeline. Okay? It's future. That sometime in the future, an administration that is, as dis, dis, that's dispensed, which you are a part of, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, in the beginning God created the heaven, and in earth, right? God created the heaven and the earth. Even in him. Even what? Both are in him. Both are in Jesus Christ. Into an authority and ruler and headship. In whom also we have been obtained, tongue tied this morning, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Being predestinated. Predestinated to what? Predestinated to this administration that's dispensed in the future. According to the purpose of Him. The purpose of God, who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. His own will was to create and let it figure out who's going to be in Christ and who isn't. And he says, you know what? Those who are going to be in Christ, they are a part of this administration. And what is it going to be? That we should be to the praise of his glory. Creation is going to look at us, that's you and me, and are going to say, wow, God is glorious. He did that with you. And now look at Look at who's in charge. And you and me are a part of that. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now, first trust. Okay? That is, that is the idea of the absolute trust. It's not like orderly. It's the, the first trust. It's a term we don't use today. It's, it's gone out of our cultural language, but the first trust is, is that, that this is what my trust is in. This is my first trust. Okay? Everything sunk into that. That's all. It's not an orderly thing. It's, it's this is where my trust is. It's my first trust. It's not, it's not a group of people that first trusted in Christ and the people are the second who trusted in Christ. That's not what he's saying. He's saying those who have put their trust in it. And what that's faith, all right? I use an analogy of a chair. There's a chair I see that I've never sat in my life. I look at it. You know, if I see a chair that looks like rickety and looks like it isn't going to hold me, you know I won't sit in it. I've looked at some lawn chairs sometimes, and I went, uh-uh. Oh, I'm not sitting in that. Why? I don't, I don't believe it'll actually do the job that's intended to do doesn't have my first trust. Okay? But, when I look at another chair, I mean, I can pick any chair in this room here, I think every one of them follows that suit, and I, you know, and I go and sit down, until I actually sit on it, do I know if it's actually going to hold me, for real? I don't, until it's proven, right? So I have to, tr I have to do this in an anticipation that it's actually going to do the job in which it's intended to do, right? So what, so what are we doing? What does the believer do? I am basing my whole eternity future based on the work of a man that hypothetically existed because some words said so. 
And I'm putting, I'm, that's going to be all my support of everything that I'm going to need for me to be okay in the future. Not only okay in the future, but to put me in this administration. Not just exist, but exist in part of something that rules. Now, I've never participated in it actively yet, right? No. But like looking at that chair, I look at these words, and these words say something. They said, you know what? I'm either going to trust it or I'm not. I've decided to trust. Don't make, doesn't mean you can't be fearful. I'm afraid. I sure hope it holds me up. I'm banking everything on it. Right? Death's door is around the corner for every one of us. None of us is guaranteed for the next five minutes. And you know what? You can't be afraid of it. You can't help if you're afraid. But in spite of the fear, what are you going to rely on? Are you going to rely on my righteousness based off of this and God said this, or are you going to rely on something else in order to give you hope? And that's what it's telling you. Okay? Those who trust. That we should be the praise of his glory who's fir who first trusted in Christ. That trust that we have is a part of the glory of God. That's a big deal. Creation's going to look at that trust. And they're going to say, you know what? They trusted it without actually seeing it. Then Paul says, in whom ye also trusted... You people in Ephesus, you people that are reading this later that aren't in Ephesus, you people who are that, at that time and at this time, you also trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news about what actually will save me from my judgment of me and my, my own works. In whom ye also trusted. After that, you what? You heard it. You heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that, ye believed. You hear it? That doesn't save you. What saves you? Well, after you believed, what happened then? You were sealed with that. What? In the dispensation of the fullness of times, he would gather all things together in one, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. When you believe that, there's your destiny. There's your predestination. Your, the anticipation of your adoption is what is guaranteed the moment you believed. And God determined that believers would get that adoption in the future to rule heaven and earth. That's what he's telling you. And he said, you know what? It's not only me that's writing about this, but it's any of you that are, that are reading this later. It's also you that are reading it in Ephesus. That Holy Spirit of promise is, is everything to do what is the mystery of his will. Verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. The mystery of his will is, is, is that you are a part of Jesus Christ. You are a part of his ownership. You are a part of his ruling. You are a part, you are a part, you are a part. Now we're going to get into some other things about members and bodies, and there's different sections of it. Yes, absolutely. But you're a part of it. That's a big stinking deal. I've never been a government authority in anything. Now, also after you believed, you were sealed with that, that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until. Okay, what's the earnest? That sealing of that Holy Spirit of promise. The moment that you believed, that, 
that Holy Spirit of promise is that you have a destiny. You know, what is my destiny? Well, I was destined to be this. I was destined to be a stay-at-home mom. I was destined to be this. I was destined to be a career person. I was destined to be an electrician. That's me, right? No, the moment I believed I was destined to be part of what happens in the dispensation of the fullness of times. That's my destiny. That's your destiny. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So God bought you, but until he actually takes full ownership of you with what? With that resurrected, redeemed body unto the praise of his glory. Now, keep your hand here. Let's go ahead to First uh, Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter four. Verse thirteen. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse thirteen. This is where we start seeing it come together. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Do we have a hope? We sure do. He's going to talk about the hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also, which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with them. If we believe that that's possible... All right. If this is what we talk about, and this is what we say, oh yeah, Christ died, Christ died and was rose the third, third day, right? Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. If he did that for Christ, he'll do that for you. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that which we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words." That is your destiny. That is the beginning of seeing this king coming together, being manifest. That's the redemption of the body. Now we have the redemption of your body, but we also have the redemption of the body. All right? Here's the gathering together of all those members of his body to where? To be with Christ. You understand that? Now, Paul wrote this in such a way, it's many times said that Paul expected it to happen in his lifetime. I actually don't necessarily believe that um, or see that to be absolute. But this book is written in anticipation because it's just as pertaining to me today. It's written in anticipation that those, the person that's reading it can read it as it can happen five minutes from now. And it'll be that way until it happens. So you know what? Maybe today. That's what Cornelius Stam said. Maybe today. Now, come back to the, to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. So now... Ephesians chapter 1, we, we, we hear this wonderful, great news. Okay? It's more than just being saved from the wrath to come, but it's also telling you that you are a part of something that you can't get out of. You're predestinated to it. Okay? Now, verse 13 again. Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Of what? Being a part of administration. You're an administer. 
which is the earnest of our inheritance until when? Until the redemption of the purchased possession. Unto the praise of his glory. Now keep that in your mind. Now let's turn to Revelation chapter 2. Now you tell me if you don't have a problem between reading these two sections. Revelation chapter 2. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, he's talking about Jesus Christ, who walketh in the midst of seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patient, and how thou canst not bear with them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Okay, that, does, that sounds all right. That sounds like a pretty faithful person, right? And has borne, and has patient, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. That sounds all right. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Uh-oh. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto these quickly, and I'll remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Hear the, him that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the seven churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Whoa, wait a minute. All of a sudden that threw a hiccup. Him that overcometh. What is, what is the tree in the midst of the paradise of God? That's the tree of life, right? If you don't overcome, does that sound like a problem with what we just read, what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus? Then we have information in the book of Revelation that's writing to the, to the church at Ephesus also. These two aren't written to the same group of people at the same time. These are two different situations. The moment you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of an inheritance, you can't get out of it if you try. The other one says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat the tree of life. That's a conditional statement. See that? That's why the book of Revelation is not written about you. And that trips people up. Every legalist will go, you know, when they're talking about that, will run to there and say, well, you need to do this, else do the first works. Now, why is that? Why do we have two books that are going on, that are, we have two sections of the Bible that are written about the same location in the world, but yet we have, we have different administrations for them? Well, come with me to the book of Acts. Come to Acts, Acts 19. Ephesus is a very important place scripturally. Okay, it's a hub of different things that are going on there. Let's see if I can find this here. Uh, let's go to uh, Acts 18. Acts 18, verse 22. Acts 18, verse 18. 18, 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, when he took his leave of the brethren and, and sailed thence to Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shore in his head in Sencrea, for he had a vow. Okay, so he's over in the area of what we call Greece. Okay? And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he entered himself into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. 
And when they desired him to tarry a longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them, saying, Farewell, I must keep the feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again in, unto you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus, and when he had landed in Caesarea, and had gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. Okay? And so now he's there in, in Antioch. Now, and after he had spent some time there, he departed and went all the, over the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order and strengthening all the disciples. Now we get introduced into another guy. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. New Testament scriptures? No. The scriptures that he had. He has a Hebrew Bible. He has the words of God that were written to the Hebrews. And he is very well versed in these things. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So we've got an individual. His name is Apollos. He's very well schooled in the scriptures. And what does he end up doing? He's actually preaching the baptism of John. He, he's, he's, he's under that part of the administration. What did John do? He pointed to the one that would do the job. Okay, the baptism was John was to prepare the way for the Lord. And he's saying, listen, you need to prepare the way for the Lord. Now, for he mightily, verse 28, convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. He's God's anointed. That's what, that's what Christ means. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus. So now we have, we have Apollos floating into Ephesus and Paul had been in Ephesus and we have Apollos leaving and then we have Paul coming into Ephesus. And we have this guy that's a Jew that convinced publicly to, to enough Jews that guess what? You can't deny that. He's your Messiah. He's met the criteria. What does Apollos only know? The baptism of John. That's the administration. He's looking for what? The kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what he's waiting for. That's what he's preaching. That's what he's teaching. Okay? Now, under the prophetic program, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, what is that? They begin to speak in tongues, right? Now, so here Paul comes into the region of Ephesus again. And it came to pass when Apollos was at Corinth. They're not in the same location at the same time. Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Whoa! Doesn't that upset? When did Paul ever ask you that? When have you received the Holy Ghost? He just said, at the moment you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. But who is he talking to? And they said unto him, we have so not so much heard that there be any Holy Ghost. We don't know anything about that. What does Apollos know? The baptism of John. And he said unto them, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, unto John's Baptism. These are people under the, 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 the proving witness testimony of their holy scriptures by the hand of Apollos that they understand that Jesus Christ is, is the Messiah, and that's it. So we don't know anything about the promise of the Holy Ghost. What does Paul do? And he said unto them, 
Unto what were you baptized? He said, unto John's baptism. Now you remember here, in the priesthood, the first thing, at the door of the tabernacle, there was a process and it was a washing. That's the first step, step one. Step two is the anointing. Now, then they, be, then they become the executing the duty of the priest. Okay? That is the result. Now, in Acts chapter 2, when they're speaking words, audible words in tongues, what are they doing? They're preaching to the people. They are actually giving the words of God in another man's tongue because what's coming out of the Hebrew mouths isn't true. So the promise of the, the Holy Ghost is this anointing of that which results in them actually operating as a priest. Verse 4, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. That's a John practice, right? And when you were washed under that, you said, I believe that. That's what they did. Okay, yep. This is a physical operation that I wouldn't go through unless I did believe it. Okay, so I went through the washing. I'm not saying I, but those people that are believing that. Okay, this is, a, this is Jewish doctrine. A baptism of repentance. No, the repentance is believing that the kingdom's coming. It looks bleak, I realize that. But if you believe that the... Do you, all right, quit. Daniel's timeline is intact. Are you going to believe it? Yep, I believe it. I'm preparing the way. You want to get on board? That's great. You got to get washed. You got to get clean because the Lord's coming. So they would get washed. Then, what happened? Their second baptism was what? That Holy Ghost baptism. And that baptism is when, remember in Acts chapter 2 when it said they had like, like lighted cloven tongues of fire on them? There's that, they're the light. There's that lit oil that would be anointed on their head. It's like it's on fire. They're the light of God speaking to the people. And what are they speaking? They're, they're, they're operating as a priest because the existing priesthood is doing what? Not telling them what God would have them to tell. Jesus Christ is your anointed. He is the anointed king of Israel. He has come. So now, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after, well, that is, on Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the, of the Lord Jesus. When they heard it, they went, oh, yes, this is what he preached, and he preached the one that comes after him, and he preached this is the Lord Jesus. Now, what was the problem with Apollos? He wasn't an apostle. Paul is. An apostle has authority to complete the job. So now, what does Paul said? Yes, yes, you were washed under that. Absolutely. We know John's baptism. Now, and when he laid his hands on them, using his apostolic authority, what's the result? The Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. That is the kingdom gospel. They spake with tongues and prophesied. That is the sign program that is all fit in this. And all the men were about how many? Verse 7, 12. You know what that's telling us? Those individuals there 
were being inaugurated into what? The kingdom gospel. They had been baptized into it. They had been put into it. That's their promise. That's their hope. That is their Messiah. And Paul comes by his apostolic authority and he says, You have been, you are in this. And here is what comes with this. In Ephesus, there's two situations of churches. They, have, they are mixed during this transitional time. You have those that are in Christ, who are of Jewish origin, believing in the kingdom, trusting in the kingdom, and the kingdom that's going to come in the future. It's not here yet. And then you have the church that is in Ephesus, about a bunch of Ephesian pagans, who don't have... who who now trusted in Christ rather than their pagan gods, and said, we trust that that is... And he says, listen, you got good news here, and I'm going to tell you administration that you have, that is coming, awaiting you. It's inevitable. You're a part of this. You're going to be a part of this. Now, so we have these two churches here, right? We have one group with this that's talking about the kingdom, and he says, guess what? You also have an inheritance. Okay? You have an adoption waiting to you. So what is going on here? Why, when you're in the book of Revelation, that, you know, so we, so we have this group of people, and he's only talking about this group of people that are in Ephesus, because the other one's left. That's what we call a rapture. That's the catching away of whom? That's what we read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We have made our exodus. Who's left? members under that kingdom gospel in the future. That's why we're not there. Does that make sense to you? You following that? So we have conflicting doctrine, but they don't conflict if you just leave them where they're supposed to be. Right now, what are you? You're a Gentile, right? You're a Gentile that's been saved by God's grace, and he said, you know what? Jew or Gentile or anybody, male or female, doesn't make a hill of beans difference whether you're a slave or whether you're the owner of a slave. doesn't matter. You trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to be your salvation, and I will, I'm going to perform that, and I'm going to do something better than that. I'm going to put you in an administration of him. You are going to be a part of his governing authority. That's what, he's, that's what he's talking about there. Now, when you read in Revelation, the church, the body of Christ, has been caught out. So now what are you dealing with? You're dealing with God picking up with this prophesied kingdom that hasn't come yet. When we do that, the book of Revelation isn't a problem for you. Okay? You don't have to look and know where the manna is or any of those sorts of things. Okay? We don't have to worry about that. We're not a part of that. Okay? So that's important. Thing. I, wanted, I want to press that in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians brings people great... A, a, a lot, you know, if a person asks me, so what should I be reading? I say, well, you know, especially someone new. I say, well, new or old, don't, don't matter. But I say, well, the book of Romans and the book of Ephesians. So they start off in the book of Romans, and that gets hard and heavy. And then they gravitate over the book of Ephesians and they see all these wonderful things right away. And they get excited. And that's typically the way it works. And that's the way it was for me. And that's how I've seen with most people. They love the book of Ephesians. It's an easy read. It's a short, shorter read. It, it talks about a bunch of good things right getting from the point. The book of Romans, what it, but the book of Romans, what it, 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 although it being super heavy, it's setting up all these things that come after that. That's why it's so heavy. Because everything is in view of that one book. That one book is written to a people that had never met Paul. Have I ever met Paul? No. That's why that book is so important. The Ephesians had met Paul. So they had the information that was given to the, to the Romans, given directly. He didn't write a letter to them. He wrote a letter about stuff afterwards.
So if, as soon as someone starts talking to you, you know, about that and, and brings you to the Revelation chapter 2 and said, yeah, well, the Ephesians, and, you know, that's you, say, no, it's not. It's not. And, you know, just the differences in, in, in the hopes of what they're talking about. Okay? <clears throat> so now, Ephesus is, is very important because, <clears throat> as a recap, is that there are there is two sets of instructions overlapping each other. Now, progressively, during that overlapping time, we have a group of Jewish Christians, and we have a group of Gentile Christians. Is there a division between them? And should there be a division between them? And what he's going to go into in, in chapter 2 and says, listen, that, that, that middle wall partition that kept them separate is gone. You can mingle in amongst each other. No problem. We're all in Christ. Now, the inauguration into that kingdom program has quit for now. So now, if you, if, when, if you ever have the pleasure to meet a, a Jewish Christian, that Jewish Christian is trusting that New Testament scripture. And that Jewish Christian Jew will have no problem with coming to your house if he's believing that scripture. Now, he might have brethren that don't believe that, that have a big problem with him floating around in and amongst the Gentiles. You're unclean. And he's saying, no, I'm not. Listen, I, I've been purged. That's not the issue. They've been purged. We could intermix amongst each other, but they've got to have the New Testament doctrine in order to have that, right? They don't have that. That's, that's, how, that's how they're tried. I mean, if you're in a room of Jews and you don't know what, what, where they're at with that, you'll find out real quick and say, Jesus Christ, you're Messiah. Jesus is the son of the carpenter. Is he, is he your Messiah? You'll know right then. Okay? You know why? You'll either hear, absolutely not, or, hey, amen. Okay, you'll know in an instant. Now, moving on. <clears throat> Verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints. All the saints. Now they're in Ephesus, and all the saints. What do we have? Jew and Gentile saints. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. You know, he's grateful for that. He's grateful that the people in Ephesus have long, uh, amongst all the saints that the Lord of our, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That's what he's praying for. That you would know more about what's going on. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. You know, for years I wondered, well, what is the hope of his calling? He'd just gone over it. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather all things together in one, both in heaven and in earth, even in him. It doesn't have to be that hard. And what is the exceeding greatness of, of his power to us word who what? Believe. According to the working of his mighty power. Okay, so there's power that comes with this, but it's by His work. So when we get ahead here, and He says, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 10, 
For we are his workmanship. We are the product that God made. He put us in one body the moment you believed. That's he fashioned it. Okay? Verse, back to chapter 1, verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ. You know what wrought iron is? It's, it's iron that's been fashioned into something. It's, been, it's, it's wrought iron. It's been worked. It's been manipulated. It, it's something different than it was before. That's you and me. We've been worked. We've been manipulated into something that we weren't before. What are we now? We're an inheritor. We're predestinated into something. We're part of Christ's body which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. He, he built something of you in Christ. Now when he seated Christ where? Far above all principalities and power and might and dominion. So there is an administration that's, that's what? Far above everything. And he fashioned you in him who is high above everything. And dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is in to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is what? His body. Okay? So now, what's he talking about here? The body. Okay? So we've got the head. Let me fix that. Sorry. Okay, so we have the body. And hath put all things under his feet. What's under your feet? Everything you have control over. And gave him to be the head. Who's the head? Jesus. The Christ. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. And you he hath quickened. So we have the head and you he hath quickened. He made alive. Where in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit which now worketh in children of disobedience among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, we skip the parenthesis. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come. See that? The ages to come. That has to do with what? Go back to chapter 1, verse 9. And hath made unto known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure with he had purpose in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Okay? Back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. It's all through this one man. Okay? We all know verse 8 and 9. Let's go to verse 10. For we are his, what? Work 
workmanship. Okay? There's the, there's the fashioning and manipulating and putting into something. Okay? We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. People read that and they say, that's a verse that tells me that I need to work. It's not what that's talking about. Okay? No, he just said, we are his workmanship. We've been built into something unto good works. We're put into that good works. We are part of that good works. That's the idea that it's talking about here. It's not talking about what you and me are doing. Now, every legalist and every person says, well, you need to... You know what? There's other passages that we should be going to and talking about saying that we should be working for the Lord. This is not one of them. It gets abused that way. It just said, we are his workmanship. It's not talking about your effort. It's talking about the effort of everybody else. It hasn't been the subject matter. The effort of everybody else, but of the Godhead, of doing something. What do we have? We have Jesus Christ doing some work. Doing all the work. We have God the Father recognizing that you believe that you believe in that work that was done and the work that I've done. Guess what? I'll put you into that work. I'll pick you a part of that. And when the moment you believed that, guess what? You have the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, doing what? Sealing you until that actually you see you see the byproduct of what you've been fashioned into. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. What works? Those works that are in the future, that in the ages to come, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time. There's the work. Okay, so now, I'm not telling you not to work for the Lord, but he's not saying that right here. It has everything to do with the subject matter of what he's talking about so far, and it has everything to do with that when you believed, God worked something out for you and put you in something that you were nowhere capable of ever nearing, being remotely close to doing. And he did it for a purpose that in the future that all creation is going to look at him and it's going to be to his glory. I'm going to look at him, you're going to look at him and say, look at what I am. Look at what I was. Creation's going to say, look at what they were. Look at what they are. And I can't wait for it, because it's when everything all gets righted. And you're a part of that. What we're going to find out here as we go on in Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to have, yeah, the prof the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, early part of Acts, you're going to hear about dealing with who? The Jew. What are you hearing now? You're hearing about anyone. You're going to hear about Gentile. And you know what? They're in one body. Based on what? Cross. Anyone who's connected that to the cross? What do we have? Crucified with him? Crucified with him? Okay. And all the other blessings that come along, right? That's what we wind up having. Okay. So we'll pick up this next time here, uh, go on from that in chapter 2 here. But the... Uh, if you, keep, if you keep in your mind, these are all the things that Christ has done. It doesn't have anything to do with doing anything other than just trusting that it is that he did it. Then you keep on the railroad tracks. As soon as you start putting your work, that's when you get derailed. And that's when it all goes haywire. So with that, let's pray and I'll let you go. Dear Father, I just want to thank you for your grace. just want to thank you for doing everything that we couldn't do. Do everything that we wouldn't do even if we could. I just want to just thank you for that. Thank you for these words that we can trust. Thank you for preserving them for us. Thank you for that ministry of preservation that you've done through believers and using them for your glory. Amen. All right. <clears throat>